Okay, um, welcome everyone. I am here with Bill Poston, who um, is has done many things over a long career, um, not, not least starting as an assistant general manager in the hotel business, but also from there moving on to Deloitte, where he became partner over around 10 years. And then after that, doing a series of very interesting things, many of it, much of it in the consulting space. Um, and we're here to talk um, about some of that, but also specifically his work um, with Calypso, where who uh, Bill was the founding partner um, of, of Calypso, which eventually went on to, to sell. Um, Bill, thank you so much for joining us. Happy to be here. Very kind of you. Um, listen, uh, I wondered if, first of all, you would mind just giving us a brief potted history of how you ended up where you are. <laughs> well, after, after that, uh, starting my career in hospitality, I actually started uh, as a freshman in, in college uh, as a front desk clerk at a truck stop motel. Wow. That, that was my... Yeah, that's the, cut, rooms, that's, that's the cold face, isn't it? <laughs> 20 rooms. Uh, the, the rate was $21 a night. Uh, wow. and it was my responsibility on the swing shift to fill all 20 rooms. Um, so I, I, from there, I moved on to other hotels, spent four years in Hawaii managing a resort. Uh, but after um, doing that for a while, decided to go back to school. Um, I went and received an MBA at the University of Texas, and that's where I got interested in consulting. Okay. Um, kind of fought my way onto the interview schedule at Deloitte Consulting. Um, they came to campus and said, we like to cast a wide net. Um, <laughs> it's not what you want to hear, is it? <laughs> well, unfortunately, that net wasn't even wide enough to catch me. Um, okay. I had to kind of fight my way onto the schedule and then um, fight my way through the process to receive an offer and join the firm in yep. 1994. Okay. And, from, and there you, from there you went, you, you were very successful at Deloitte. Um, what, just, just out of interest, especially I'm thinking of some of my students um, who will be listening to this, what skills enabled you to get to what skills do you think enabled you to get to partner at, at Deloitte? So in, in the consulting world, obviously, you know, it requires a, um, a certain amount of you know, intellectual acumen to be able to compete uh, in you know, probably some of the, the most incredible talent pools on the planet. Um, but I, I think the background in hospitality uh, the, the work ethic, having grown up on a farm, uh, the, the combination of those things is what really drove my career in the early days. Yep. Um, I may not be able to outthink you, um, but I could probably outwork you. Okay. And, um, I, I, you know, I didn't have a lot to offer, uh, to a client when I started in the business. Sure. Sure. Okay. And, what type of farm was it out of interest? A dairy farm. Okay, that is hard work. So <laughs> where, where I live, where I grew up in Cornwall, big dairy farming, I mean, not big compared to America's size, but um, I used to go and help farmers when I was younger with the, with the feeding and occasionally milking. Uh, well, small, smaller farms than I guess you'd be used to, but I know about early mornings. This was decidedly small scale. Okay. <laughs> 35 cows. Wow. Wow. Okay. Okay. Very small. Okay. And you made a decision uh, to leave Deloitte, which many people um, wouldn't do. They, you know, obviously a, a well-paid position and a job that, you know, you can, you can retire on if you, if you wanted to. Why did, why did you decide to leave? I, I loved the firm and I considered my decade there to be an apprenticeship that was incredibly valuable. I, I, I got caught up in a transition in the industry uh, in the early 2000s in the wake of the Enron WorldCom scandals and what uh, turned out to be the big separation of consulting from accounting sure. uh, in the US and ultimately globally. 
And so there were significant changes in the structure of the firm at the time. Uh, many of my mentors and advisors chose to retire yep. in, in, in the wake of all that turmoil. Yep. And so I, I just viewed it as an opportunity to reconsider uh, the future and reconsider options. Yep. Um, I still love the firm. Some of my best times and best friends are still there, um, but I certainly don't regret the decision. You know, sitting, okay, sitting you, took an, you, you took an even braver decision and I, I guess still still risky because, you know, uh, you weren't at Deloitte for that long. So I'm guessing, you know, there perhaps was still a mortgage and various other liabilities, but you took a decision to to start Calypso. What what prompted that decision? Why did you do that rather than, say, joining another large consultancy? Uh you know, I was naive about the economics of the industry. Um, it was pretty simple to do the math around the, the revenues that I was managing as a partner and the gross margins that yeah. were being uh, delivered from those engagements. Um, and so I just figured, how hard can it be? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I say naively, uh, you know, with intent, right? There was yeah. this this great pool of things that we didn't know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now we knew how to sell. We knew how to serve clients. We knew how to develop people, right? These, these are the fundamentals that you learn in that apprenticeship role, sure. spending 10 years at a large consulting firm. I had had an opportunity to work around the world, um, you know, global exposure. It, it, um, and so I didn't really view it as risky. Um, you know, ultimately it was myself and my partner, because I started Calypso with another partner from the firm. Yep. Um, we viewed it as a bet on ourselves. Yep. Sure. We didn't yep. need some new technology to work out, right? This yep. was about, can, can we go do this and make a living? And, and, and when you when you left, um, I guess two questions. One is, did you did you have um, a plan to to grow and then potentially sell the firm? Um, and the second question is, were you given a soft landing? So did Deloitte allow you to take clients with you when you left? So the answer to the first question is we, we didn't uh, start with the objective of selling. Sure. We started with the objection of making a living. Yep. Uh, and so that allowed us to have, a, well, I think, maybe a longer term perspective on the plan. Yep. Um, we, we were very aggressive in growth in the early years, um, but that was just a function of needing to get to some level of relevancy sure. in the market. Yep. Um, right? we, we had tremendous ambitions but they weren't to sell something. It, it was to, to build a sustainable firm that we enjoyed uh, the people we worked with. We did great work with clients and, and you know, we're having fun and making money. Yep, sure. Um, my exit from Deloitte was very uh, amicable. They were very helpful, um, you know, because the industry was in transition. Sure. Um, you know, clearly we weren't the only people that were, you know, considering the future. Yeah. Um, there was, um, we, we didn't have, you know, taking clients or anything uh, as direct as that. Um, but there was, uh, you know, a, a very nice transition okay. uh, out. And I viewed it as very important to make sure that those relationships stayed intact. Great. Yeah. They call it a, go a golden parachute, don't they? When you're, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah okay. That's, um, and, and could you tell us a little bit about Calypso itself, firstly, in terms of what it started off doing and then what it eventually became? Yeah, so our mission from the very beginning was to help our clients deliver on the promise of innovation. Um, you know, our, our experience over this period of time from the late 80s, you know, to the mid 2000s was clients had invested heavily in efficiencies. Yep. Right. You can think about re-engineering and outsourcing, yep. you know, they kind of stripped down 
uh, as bad as lean as they could get. Yeah. Um, yeah. In the wake of that, and maybe in some cases in parallel, they had globalized, right? So they'd, they'd grown the top line by expanding their markets. They'd grown the bottom line by cutting costs. Hmm. And our position was what got lost was innovation. Sure, yeah. Right, the ability to grow by creating new things that the market demanded. Yeah, sure. And so our hypothesis was that, you know, there was there was only so much you could cut and the globe was only so big. So if you're going to continue to grow, you have to innovate. Yep. Okay. And, and, and that was what we did. And did that remain did that remain fairly central to you over the over the 16 years that you grew the firm? Absolutely. I mean, it, it remains the mission of the firm today. Sure. Uh, now, the methods shifted, um, right? There's uh, much more uh, much more concentration on digital technologies, uh, being able to integrate global development teams, um, the enterprise software world that supports engineering and product development has matured over that period of time. So... You know, we used to do a lot of this on whiteboards and Excel spreadsheets and, you know, the, the tools and the methods have changed, but the fundamental objectives and mission of the firm remain the same. Okay. okay. And so you, you, you kind of hinted earlier that whilst, whilst you had, you know, your, your good experience in delivery <clears throat> and, and sales, it wasn't as plain sailing as perhaps you might have thought early on. Could you give us some idea of the challenges of growth that you encountered with Calypso? <laughs> yeah. <I> mean, <laughs> Big question. It, well, I mean, you you start off with a full-time, more than a full-time job of selling, delivering, and developing people. Yep. But then you have to go figure out, uh, wow, payroll is not as easy as just paying people. Right, you have multi-state issues. The United States is particularly complex because each state has a different set of tax laws. Um, come to find out, if you're going to hire people, they expect you to have a competitive benefit program, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, you have to have a, a, a retirement plan, and you have to have a health insurance plan, and you know, you have to have um, all of these things that, you know, at the time weren't just go buy it off the shelf, right? We, yep. we had to knit these things together. Um, so it's got to keep the books. Um, you've got, you know, we were tracking time uh, and expenses on Excel spreadsheets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. So, you know, I joke in the early days, right? I mean, I was the, I made the coffee, I took out the trash, you yeah. know, I processed the payroll and, you know, that all of that effort was uh, an education um, but it also kept me out of the market. Yeah, right sure. Now. Yep. And so yep. when I say I was naive when I left um, Deloitte to start Calypso, it wasn't about consulting. I, I knew how to do that. Yep. Uh, I had learned that in, in 10 years. What I didn't know was legal, HR, sure. accounting, taxes, you know, technical infrastructure, uh, all that stuff. Yep, yep. Yeah. And and at what point did you because <clears throat> a lot of firms, I guess, go through this this phase where they're trying to do everything themselves and they have to do everything themselves in terms of keeping the margins up and paying their people. <clears throat> at what point did you you get to the stage where you thought, OK, we're going to get a we're going to get a CFO. We're going to get someone specialist in to do the people side. We're going to have systems in place to do all, all of the stuff that we're doing on 10 Excel spreadsheets. At what point did that transition happen or was it just a slow evolution generally? Um, it was a slow evolution, but, you know, it was right about the time that I also hired someone to uh, keep my yard. <laughs> it's just how much do you value your own time? Yeah, sure. Right. When you're in pure startup mode, um, I had a tendency not to place enough value on my own time. Okay. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, I, I, I don't know that I had any other option. Sure. Um, but, you know, at some point you say, why am I doing, you know, yeah. low value administrative work when my clients are waiting for me to return a phone call? Sure. Yep. 
Who's, who was your first hire then? Was your, was your first hire with the sort of admin assistant or was it uh, at the consultant level or senior consultant level? Well, in the early days, everybody wore multiple hats. Okay, sure. So not only were we hiring client service professionals, they were all tasked with night and weekend work. Okay, sure. To, to help run the business. Okay, okay. And I guess at some point you got in... Um, in fact, definitely because you couldn't you couldn't do it otherwise. I'm guessing you got in some form of integrated system that kind of put together the pipeline and the resourcing and the project management and that type of stuff. Just yeah. out of interest, how how big were you when that's when that happened? If you remember, oh, I mean, we in our first year of operation, we did just under four million dollars of revenue. Wow. Okay. Um, so this so is a it, fine start. Yeah. No, I mean, well, first first. Five for six months was nine hundred thousand, uh, and then we were really just constrained by hiring. Right, we, sure. we had the demand, but yep. we needed to build our team in order to be able to deliver. Okay, um, so it, it quickly got to the point where uh, you know I was just spending 20, 30 hours a week doing things that were not directly attributable to consulting. Sure. Okay, I, I guess I guess at some point, see, with at least at least with many firms, that's actually a position, you know, that the the leaders want to be in. Eventually, you get to a certain size, and the leaders don't do much implementation at all. They you know uh, delegate it, and they focus on business development and and you know leadership. Um, is, is that a decision that you took explicitly at some point, or did you kind of kind of find yourselves falling into that role? Um, I didn't get into consulting to be an administrator. Okay. I sure. mean, I, I, you know, in, in, in consulting, I think this is true in all the professions. You get your personal gratification from serving clients. Yep. I mean, you have to love that. But for me personally, the gratification comes much more on developing people side. Okay. Right. I mean, we always compete in two markets. We compete in the market for clients and we compete in the market for talent. Sure. Um, and I, I, my opinion is to be wildly successful in the professions is you have to love both of those things. Sure. I yeah, agree completely. Let me, let me ask you then, how did you, it's a challenge a lot of small firms don't succeed on. And, you know, they're, they're great on the, in fact, one of my clients at the moment, fantastic on the delivery side, got too much business coming through. They're really struggling with the people side in, in terms of getting people of the right quality, but also getting people that fit the culture of the firm. So how did you, how did you address that challenge? So we were very, very uh, explicit about our culture and our values from before we even launched the firm. Okay. Right. We, our value statements today, 18 years later, are identical word for word uh, to wow. what they were when we started the business. Okay. And we hire against that profile. Right. We, we know what good looks like. We know what the fit profile is. And so we hire against that profile. Okay, it, I guess it's one it's one thing um, it's one thing having the values and hiring against it. It's another thing getting people to apply for those jobs. So how did you how did you solve that problem? Well, we were we were the hip new place doing work in innovation. So who who wouldn't want sure, yeah. to okay. join that firm? <laughs> um, I, I misspoke about our values. We did have one additional value statement that we dropped somewhere along the way. Okay. Um, when we very first started the business, we had a, we had seven statements. Yep. Now we only have six. Okay. Okay. Um, and was um, that what, what the one we the one we lost? Yep. The one we lost was we don't golf. Okay. Okay. <laughs> that became untrue at some point, I guess. Yeah. Eventually, we just couldn't stick to that particular value. <laughs> <laughs> I'm imagining you going through reams of CVs looking for the mention of golf, <laughs> just in case. <laughs> okay, um, was there anything else that surprised you 
or you found challenging? Um, I mean, other, other than the sheer amount of work that it takes to grow a successful consulting firm, were there any other sort of surprises or big challenges that you encountered over the years? I mean, the thing we got wrong the most was we assumed that we would be a small startup firm serving small to medium sized businesses. Okay. And that never happened. Okay. Our, our first client was Kodak. Um, our second client was Pepsi. Wow. Uh, and it went from there. Our third wow. client was Johnson and Johnson. And so the whole small serving small thing never happened. Okay, in that, 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 I mean, that's fantastic because then obviously not easy accounts to get, but that raises another question because by going for those clients, you're competing with some of the big boys, including possibly Deloitte itself. So how did you, how did you compete in that space when, you know, there's already existing relationships, perhaps there's incumbents, uh, perhaps people can just throw, you know, resource at, at a problem. So how, how did you compete in that in, with the big firms? So the only way we were able to win in those situations was with focus, right? Our message to those prospective clients was, we're exclusively focused on innovation, but we bring a comprehensive set of capabilities to help you address your needs across that entire cycle. Okay. And, you know, it, it wasn't easy, but it's pretty powerful when you can stand in front yep. of a client and say, this is all we do. Yep. The people yep. that I'm bringing to this project do this for a living day in and day out. They're not generalists, they are specialists. Okay. Okay, here's, here's, um, here's a question. So do, do you know the firm um, uh, Elixir? I'm not familiar, no. So, so they, I mean, relatively similar path. So started 10 years ago, <clears throat> um, in, focused on strategy and innovation. Actually, they remind, the, um, the founder, Steve Newton, reminds me of you a lot. He's, um, you know, you can see he's, he's, he's bullish, he's good at business development, he's a hard worker. He's built this firm floated it on the stock exchange last year. Um, and one of the challenges he mentioned with sort of doing innovation work is actually the firm itself keeping abreast of innovation. And one of the things he says is that you can't out innovate the market. And one of the things he does is put people in contact with, you know, small startups that they know or have invested in or relationships they've got rather than trying to do everything themselves. In terms of what challenge that addresses, I guess with innovation, there's a challenge that any consultancy has of keeping relevant and making sure they know what's on the market. So how do you, how did you, was, it, was, that, was that a challenge for you? And if so, how did you address it? Um, I mean, I, I think we did a pretty fair job of staying abreast of innovations and innovation. Sure, yeah. Because that was our that was our world. I mean, we were we 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 bathed in it every day, right? I mean, yeah, we're okay. reading the literature, and and our clients are our clients are reading the literature. So we we darn well better be sure reading the literature. Um, I think our our biggest challenge was preventing bad ideas. <laughs> you know, they're just because. There's, there's such a, a, a desire to grow through innovation. Um, there were lots of experiments being run over the course of, you know, those years. Yep. And, you know, we, we had to kind of rein people back in frequently. Yep, sure. Right. It's like, I'm sorry, but you are not Apple. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And. And the, the way that they do this is not going to work in your industry, in your culture, you know, in your corporation. So yeah. we have to we have to help you develop solutions that are appropriate for you. Yeah. OK. OK. And I, I also guess internally, there's also a balance between sort of investment in innovation and also, you know, still bringing in the money and, you know, not not losing too many bets, because with innovation, it's hard to predict always what's going to be successful 
Right. We, my, one of my partners famously said over and over again, we have to make payroll this week sure, <laughs> and we have to invest for the future. Yeah. 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 And it's not, you know, it's, it's not a, um, it's not a small investment either, is it? As, as you pointed out earlier, you know, top people that top clients want to bring in cost top money. Um, sure. But the amount of money that gets wasted in innovation is also astounding. Okay. I mean, if you think about if you think about um, supply chain efficiencies and back office efficiencies, yep. we manage things to you know the hundredth decimal place. Yep, yep. And innovation, it's a black box, right? You just throw money at it and let's see what comes out the other <laughs> sure. end. Um, there's no accountability. There's really no measurement. It's yeah, just yeah. a lot of it gets wasted. Yep. I can I can understand that your your value proposition is never really going to go out of fashion, is it? And I don't mean the word fashion. It's not going to go out of demand because to 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 succeed requires innovation, and innovation requires bets, and those bets are very often not well managed. Correct. Um, okay, I want to move on to to sort of your um, the the way you grew, and. Um, you focus specifically on five markets, but it strikes me that it's it would be quite easy to say, well, we're going to add another market. We're going to add another market. What what's the strategy behind focusing purely on five markets? I mean, we, we even at the end, we were never a uh, Goliath. Sure, we had about 300 professionals at the time that we sold the business. And so that story that I told about focus and saying, you know, this is what we do every day remained an important element of our success all along. Sure. And it's not just innovation that is important. It's the industry knowledge Right, combined with the functional expertise and innovation that really created the power. And there were always calls to expand our scope of services, always calls to expand our industry focus. And we had to fight really hard to, to say no and stay focused. Sure, yeah. And we didn't always succeed, right? I mean, we, we screwed up more things than, than we got right. Um, you know, we expanded internationally too fast. Um, we got into training, which turned out to be a huge distraction and a commercial failure. Um, we took flyers and, you know, attempting to do government work that really okay. proved to be futile. Um, so it's not that we did everything right. It's that yeah. the things we did right, we did really well. Okay. Uh, and the things that we messed up we recognize we're a mistake and stop trying, you know, before it became fatal. Sure. Okay. You, you said something very, you said a few interesting things there. One of them was around international expansion. Um, and certainly with my own clients, uh, I, I warn against early international expansion because in my view, it's just like starting another business, but in a completely alien territory. Yeah. Um, what was your experience there and what lessons did you learn? Um, Europe is hard. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Asia is harder. Okay, right. And a, and a long way away. Yeah, sure. Um, now, in the in the pandemic era, you know, some of this may be marginally easier because we're not getting on airplanes and flying, you know, to to clients every week. Yep. But you still have all the same difficulties of local culture, local language. Um, even just simple things like, does this country have a mature professional services economy? Yeah, yeah. If you show up and say, hey, I'm charging you 3,500 US a day. Yeah. Are they going to buy or are they going to just, you know, fall out of their chair and then close the door? Yeah, I, I did a piece of work um, last year uh, or the year before, um, looking at where consulting revenues come from. And e even now, 80% of all consulting revenues come from five Western countries. Um, Absolutely. And although it's growing elsewhere, 
it's really interesting, you know, you would have experienced this, both, both in terms of the institutions that other countries have, but also the culture, you know, suspicion of outsiders, network relationships and things like that mean they simply don't buy consultants. Yeah, I mean, it's the US, UK, Germany, France, Nor maybe the Nordics. Yeah, yeah, Japan. it's, um, yeah. I, I bought it, and even it's fascinating. So one of the first projects I did during my doctorate, this is 20 years ago, um, I went to Italy to ask people why they weren't using, I said, who do you use for expertise? And they'd say, Eloigi down the road, he's my brother's <laughs> sister's friends, you know. Yeah. And they, the idea of paying for, you know, expertise from someone they didn't know was completely off, off the rails. Yeah. Um, so did, was it a case of expanding and it didn't go as well as you thought, or did you have to retract and then expand in, I guess, which, which stories were more successful than others with expansion? So we, we went to Europe because our clients needed us in Europe. Sure. Uh, this, this was the, you know, the, the international arm of US based clients. Okay. Yep. Yep. Um, and it was, it wasn't that it wasn't successful. Right. We we built a team. We did great work. Um, yeah. But the the management time and attention required to manage that team. Sure. Yep. And and the size of the team, it was so small compared to the outsized level of attention that was required to make it work. Yeah. OK. OK. And how, how did you manage that that balance between sort of control and freedom between local offices. I mean, some firms will send over a partner, they'll set up an office and then that partner will eventually retreat and let the office run itself. In terms of things like profit and loss and accountability, <clears throat> what, was your, what was your balance there? Was it more controlled from the center or was it more just let them run themselves and then more cream off 20%? Um, it was more autonomous. I mean, we, okay. we had a, a great partner uh, in the Netherlands from the very beginning I mean, okay. we, we, we started in Europe the within 18 months of starting the firm um, and and so we had a great partner there from the very beginning that took responsibility for running that operation okay um, the only issue is it just didn't scale um, <clears throat> right I mean it, it never it never kept up with yep. the growth yep. rates that we experienced in the US okay okay and just, just out of it, what, do you think that was the appetite for innovation, or do you think it? Because I know European countries tend to be a little bit, bit more cautious when it comes to investment and innovation generally. Or do you think it was more sort of the cultural barriers that were were in place for an overseas company operating in Europe? My, my. Yes, and it's, this is just, people in the United States were more comfortable hiring small unknown firms. Okay, yep. And people in Europe were just more comfortable going with large established players. Okay. That's interesting. Okay. Okay, all right. So thank you. That really, really interesting. Um, and I guess, uh, there's two things I'd like to talk about. One is one is the sort of the your, you know your reflections. If you were if you were giving advice to someone in your position, a partner in Deloitte who was you know thinking of leaving and starting up in the innovation space or something similar, what advice you'd you'd have? So let's deal with that first. What advice would you give would you give a partner starting up for the first time? Well, I don't. I don't not, not only have advice, I have a pitch. Ah, excellent. There we go. <laughs> yes, you do. Of course you do. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I mentioned that we kind of naively stumbled into starting Calypso. Yep. With, you know, we, we knew what we knew about consulting and people development, but didn't know a lot about running a business. Yep. So uh, our new organization is named The Launchbox. And what we do is help new founders launch professional services firms. And one of the things that we provide to them is a business engine that essentially takes care of all of that nonsense that I used to spend nights and weekends doing in yep. the early days of Calypso. 
So we have not only a fully integrated um, suite of software products that run a startup firm, we also have the people that know how to do it, the programs in place for payroll and benefits and IT support and marketing and legal and you know all of these things that create massive headaches. We offer that in a box. So you, you, you preempted my second question, which was really to ask about, about Launchbox, which is, yeah. which, you know, I, I know the professional service space and I know there's, there are firms that offer sort of merger and acquisition advice. Um, and there's a few firms that act as private equity and all the rest of it. This is the first time I've seen a firm um, act with that level of support. And it completely makes sense in terms of, you know, the, I've forgotten the phrase you would use, but there's a, there's a setup cost to these things that once it's spread yeah. across several other firms, you know, that cost gets lower. Um, sure. So how, how, how does it work? So I've, you know, I've got a, I've got a small professional service firm myself. It's only me and two others at the moment, but if I wanted to scale, how does it work in terms of if I came to you and said, look, you know, I, I'm worried about growth. Yeah. I'm going to need support. How does it work normally? So our message is, you know, we want you focused on what you do best, right? Selling, delivering, managing your team. Yep. And so if, if you can spend 100% of your time doing those three things, we'll take care of all the nonsense, right? So we provide you with that, that business support and that business engine. We also provide you with the capital that you need to essentially de-risk your transition. Sure, yep. Right, you asked me about the risk of leaving Deloitte. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, you're, you're leaving a job making X dollars to take a job making zero dollars. Yeah, sure, yes. Right? The first it's day. a bit of a shock, isn't it, when you suddenly realize that you're responsible for that, you know, yeah. that pile of cash. Well, imagine the conversation. You go home to your spouse and you say, guess what? I'm going to quit my job. Uh, yeah. And I don't know when I'm going to get paid again. Yeah. Um, so providing the cushion and the startup capital to be able to hire the team and not have to sell the work before you hire the team. Yeah, you know, yeah, sure. That's always the, 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 the conundrum in the beginning is, you know, you, you've got a foot on the gas pedal and a foot on the brake all the time we, so I we, we, we just Sorry, say no. give it the gas right just... yeah 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 so but I, I presume there's some you must um I presume that you can't invest in everyone and I presume there's some due diligence because just in terms of numbers and risk you wouldn't want sure. to do that so it, is there a, a kind of application process for that yeah so we're constantly evaluating opportunities um the the biggest screen, the, the first screen yep. is, do you really want to build a business to scale or are you interested in a lifestyle? Yeah, sure. Okay. And there's lots of people that think that starting their own consulting firm is going to provide them with a nice lifestyle. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, I've never seen it, but I assume it's possible <laughs> because so many people decide to do it. Yeah. Um, you know, honestly, if I'm going to uh, put money behind you and yep. put the time and energy behind you, I'm not all that concerned about your lifestyle. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, <laughs> let's go build something that has real value. Yes. Um, yep. That's the first screen is, is, you know, do you want to, are you, are you ambitious enough to go build something that actually has scale? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then it's really the old venture capital game. I mean, sure, there has to be a... Um, a credible business proposition, but we're evaluating people as much as we are business plans and models. Yeah, sure. Yeah, definitely. Yes. And I, you know, I, my, my experience is that a lot of people who think they want to scale a business, actually, when they get down to the nitty gritty in a few years time, realize actually it's either they're not suited to it or they don't like it, I guess. Well, I think we help in that capacity because, again, if, if scale doesn't hurt you as the founder, mm. right, because you have a partner that's actually doing the run the business stuff, yep. Yep. Uh, and your job is just to manage the people and the client portfolio and you know, maintain 
a culture and a set of values yep. and deliver with quality, um, then scale shouldn't be as scary. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so with your launch box hat on, um, what's the what's the biggest challenge that you see among sort of new new founders? You've got a good idea, quite ambitious, want to grow. What's um what do you see most commonly that that gets in the way of success there? Uh, there are a lot of people that are good at what they do, but are not personally commercially viable. Okay. Yep. Okay. Right. They they have the skills to deliver. They have the capability to build a team. Yep. But they don't bring a client portfolio. They don't really possess the capability to build a business. Um, and so a lot of after I get past that first screen of you know lifestyle business yep. or scale. Yep. It's I, a lot of people say, hey, I'm really good at this. I just need you to sell it for me. Okay, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, and that doesn't work for us. I mean, no. we, we're, we don't propose to be your business development engine. Yeah. I'm yeah. looking for commercially viable founders that mm. uh, have a history of being able to sell work and maintain yeah. a network of client relationships. Yeah. And I can I can imagine once you get th through those two gates, you know, um, lifestyle first of all, and secondly, you mm -hmm. know, the business development focus, you you can whittle down a good you know sixty percent, seventy percent of of people from that conversation. Oh sure, I know. I mean, we're with the the number of firms that we actually back and launch versus yeah. the conversations we have is I mean at, at least 20 to 1. Yeah sure yeah yes it's um that it's it's interesting isn't it that business development focus is something that so especially from large consultancies it's different if you get to partner but a lot of people as you know they bump up against partner they leave and they haven't necessarily had that business development experience um yeah. or even that mindset necessarily. And well, even, even at the partner level, um, it's hard to determine how much of that success was truly attributable to their entrepreneurial abilities and how much was the institution responsible yeah. for their success. Yeah, yeah. It's different when there's a calling card. Yes. Yeah. It's fascinating. It's, it's, such, it's such a lovely, it's such a neat business idea. Um, and, you know, I know you are doing well, but I, I do hope you continue to do well with it. I can't see any reason why you wouldn't. Um, what, so what are your plans? for? So is it, you know, grow, continue to invest and just see what happens? Sure. Well, we've uh, we've started four businesses in 2021. Right. Um, and, you know, we are in discussions with a, a, a good handful of others to launch in 2022. Yeah. OK. Um, our preferred cadence is to launch a business a quarter. Okay, sure. So, I mean, we, we don't want to overextend ourselves. Yeah, we also yeah. want to make sure that we're being very diligent about, you know, the businesses that we go yeah, in. Yeah. Um, so that's the plan really to, to launch a new firm uh, every quarter uh, and to do that, you know, for at least the next five years. Sure. And, um, uh, so far, it's been phenomenal. I mean, the two firms that we started in the spring uh, did over a million dollars in client service revenue wow. each wow. in their first six months. Gosh. So they hit their cumulative million dollar mark before they got to six months of, of age as a business. Um, That's really impressive. And and what I know your proposition is to take the is to take the workload or you know the, the the back office, but I'm guessing you also advise on on the strategy side of things, the niche potential markets, how to grow that type of stuff. And um, you know, so far, uh, different uh, ones of our founders have asked for and needed more advice than others. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, we're we're a partner. I mean, when we go into these businesses, we're not a service provider. Yep. Um, we're not just a venture capital investor, right? We are a partner in the business yep. um, and we're there to go arm in arm to market and make sure that the, the business grows uh, 
in a controlled fashion, um, but also just as rapidly as the founder and the market will allow. And, and I presume it's early days now because, you know, you've only been going a couple of years, but further down the line, you're going to be at the other end, which is, you know, some of these firms are going to want um, to sell. Uh, some of the founders are going to want to exit. Um, that's, I guess, a bridge you've got to cross, but I'm guessing the M&A side of things will become increasingly important to you over the next few years. Sure. I mean, we're, we have a, a fairly uh, long view of these investments. You know, sure. it's a, a five to eight year journey with any yep. given founder. Um, if someone's able to scale and sell faster, that, that would be fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Um, but we want to be deliberate. You know, we're not, we're not looking sure. to, we're not, we're not flipping houses. You know, yeah, yeah. About <laughs> building something that has real value. Yeah. Uh, and so when we go to market, um, you know, we can expect to achieve premium valuation for our founders and these businesses. Brilliant. Bill, thank you so much. It, it's, it's, be, it's a fascinating journey um, and you've given some real nuggets that, you know, our listeners are going to enjoy. Um, and I wish you all the best and continued success with, with LaunchBots. Well, I enjoyed the conversation. Thank you, Joe. Okay, take care. Cheerio. Bye-bye.